This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We're in the series Swan Songs, where I detail crimes that inspired songs. On this episode, a young girl is brutally murdered, and the case becomes a sensation around the world. Most of the media coverage would focus on the preppy killer, Robert Chambers, as a young, handsome, wealthy prep school student with a promising future. His victim, Jennifer Levin, would be portrayed as a fast-living, spoiled, Upper East Side teen whose lifestyle led to her demise. Neither of these would be accurate portrayals. I'll give you all the details and unravel this case to bring you the true story of the murder of Jennifer Levin. This is the second chapter of Swan Songs. The Killers was a rock band that was formed in 2001 in Las Vegas, Nevada. Brandon Flowers, who provided lead vocals and played keyboards and bass, teamed up with Dave Kooning, who became the Killers' lead guitarist. Soon, bassist Mark Sturmer and drummer Ronnie Venucci joined the band. They played venues around Las Vegas, bringing a unique British pop indie rock sound and soon built a following. The Killers would be compared to throwback bands like The Cure, New Order, and Duran Duran. They caught the attention of Green Day's former manager, Jeff Saltzman, but it wasn't until an A&R representative from the UK heard their demo that they were offered a recording contract in 2003. They signed with the British label Lizard King Records and released their debut album titled Hot Fuss in 2004. Hot Fuss was a huge success, reaching number one in the UK in January 2005. It then crossed over into the US charts, reaching a peak position of number seven. The band went on to become a success worldwide. But there were two songs released on Hot Fuss, inspired by an American crime, that two decades earlier rocked New York City and then the nation. In the single Midnight Show, the song begins with a boy singing about a girl in a short skirt and his feelings of jealousy. He hints at having killed her, saying he, quote, took her breath away beneath the stars, unquote, and then sings about keeping a secret. In another cut on the album, the girl is named. The song is titled, Jenny Was a Friend of Mine, and the lyrics begin, We took a walk that night, but it wasn't the same. We had a fight on the promenade out in the rain. She said that she loved me, but she had somewhere to go. She couldn't scream while I held her close. As the song continues, we come to understand that the boy is being questioned by the police about the murder of a girl. He provides an alibi saying, Jenny was a friend of mine. There was no motive for this crime. Jenny was a friend of mine. The inspiration for the song Brandon Flowers and Mark Sturmer wrote came from the murder of 18-year-old Jennifer Levin and her accused killer's statements to the police. He was questioned hours after the girl's body was found, battered and strangled to death in New York's Central Park. Indeed, the accused killer, Robert Chambers, and Jennifer Levin were acquainted and had even casually dated one another earlier that year. They were part of a circle of teens and young adults who lived and or socialized in the area of the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Both Jennifer and Robert had attended New York prep schools, but neither were raised in homes with wealthy society-set parents like many of their friends and acquaintances. While it was Jennifer's life that would be cut short so cruelly and unexpectedly, it was her reputation that would be dragged through the mud during the investigation into her death and the subsequent trial. Robert Chambers, at first, would have many supporters who rallied behind him, despite the fact that his past was quite checkered. His background would belie the moniker given to him by the media of the preppy killer. How did this happen? Well, to explain, I'll need to start at the beginning and tell you a bit more about Jennifer Levin and Robert Chambers. Jennifer Don Levin was born on May 21, 1968, in Nassau County, New York. 
located on the North Shore of Long Island. Her parents, Stephen and Ellen Levin, were divorced. Stephen Levin was a realtor in Soho. He had remarried and moved into a loft in Soho before it became the upscale neighborhood it is now. Soho, a neighborhood located in Lower Manhattan, was starting to undergo a makeover in the 1980s, but it was still affordable on a middle to upper middle class income and was located close to many good New York prep schools. Ellen Levin lived in the Tribeca neighborhood, just blocks away from her ex-husband. Jennifer and her younger sister, Danielle, had easy access to both parents. Jennifer was close to her mom, but as is somewhat typical of teens and their parents, Jennifer and her mother clashed at times. She had moved to her father's loft in Soho, wanting to put a little space between her and her mom, but it wasn't working out the way she'd hoped. She and her father also clashed, and Jennifer felt like an outsider. She didn't get along well with her stepmother and sometimes felt hurt and angry that he seemed to take his wife's side over hers. She also told friends she felt like she'd intruded into her father's life. She hated being alone at his apartment with her stepmom when he was away at work. As a result, she spent more time with her friends, hanging out in the Upper East Side. Jennifer was attending a small private school, Baldwin, on West 74th Street, across the city from where she lived. This felt like a different world than where she'd grown up. She was a suburban girl from Long Island, and now she was running with wealthy kids who'd been raised in Manhattan and lived a life of privilege. They resided in high-rise apartment buildings with doormen, wore the latest fashions, and had almost unlimited freedom and the money to enjoy it. While Jennifer was somewhat of an outsider, you couldn't tell it according to her friends and classmates. She was a naturally beautiful girl, fresh-faced, innocent, and comfortable in her own skin, with an easy way about her. Fun-loving and high-energy, she made friends easily and was quite popular. Everyone who knew Jennifer loved her. Some would say that they felt an instant connection with her the moment they met. She was just so easy to be around. While Jennifer didn't have all the expensive clothes her friends did, she was very interested in fashion, and her goal was to become a designer. She was able to put pieces of her own clothing together with a few items borrowed from friends to create her own unique style. One of her summer jobs was working at a clothing chain called The French Connection that catered to teens. With her employee discount and the money she made, Jennifer was able to indulge her passion for trendy clothes. In the mid-1980s, prep school kids in New York were possessed of a freedom that most teens could only envy. They had credit accounts at stores, restaurants, and even bars throughout the city. It was easy to get fake IDs, and most did. Of course, most establishments knew that the kids they were serving alcohol to were underage. But as long as mom or dad paid for their bar tab each month, the booze continued to flow. Why would parents allow their children to drink and hang out at bars at all hours? They were paying for expensive prep schools for their children, not just in the hopes they'd receive a good education, but also, and sometimes more importantly, so that they could make the right connections. Being socially connected was everything and could lead to opportunities like being admitted to more exclusive colleges and marrying into the right families. It could also lead to better business opportunities in the future. Socializing outside of school was an important part of making these connections. To facilitate this, some parents looked the other way or even actively encouraged their teens to hang out at trendy bars and clubs that catered almost exclusively to preppies or prep school students. By the time she was 16 years old, Jennifer had started spending most of her weekends and summers hanging out in these Upper East Side clubs with her friends. She, like most of her friends, had a fake ID. One of the most popular hangout spots for prep school kids was Dorian's Red Hand, a bar located at 2nd Avenue and 84th Street. Jennifer had been dating a boy named Brock Purness off and on since her freshman year of high school. They had strong feelings for one another, but also openly dated other people. They were young and not ready to commit to an exclusive relationship, although that was a plan they had for the future. Jennifer spent the summer of 1985 in the Hamptons, working at a boutique where she'd secured a job. The Hamptons was where a lot of the wealthier kids had vacation homes or whose parents rented homes for the summer. It was an extension of the social scene. Anybody who was anybody summered in the Hamptons. By the fall, Jennifer had returned to the city to begin her senior year. 
Also that fall, Jennifer became a regular at Dorian's Bar. The following winter on Valentine's Day, Jennifer Levin was introduced to Robert Chambers. Saving money on award-winning wine you're guaranteed to love has never been easier with First Leaf. Other wine clubs just guess about your favorite wines, but First Leaf uses your feedback and ratings to curate just the right wines for your unique taste. First Leaf is so confident in the quality of their wine, they even have a 100% satisfaction guaranteed. So if you're not feeling a particular bottle of wine, First Leaf will cover it completely. No problem. I took the fun and easy First Leaf wine quiz. To be honest, I was curious to find out my exact wine drinking preferences. I got to answer questions like the sweetness level of wine I prefer, what styles I like, etc. So First Leaf could learn all about what I like. I tend to buy more white wines than reds, but I've liked some red wines I've had in the past a lot. The problem is, I forgot what they were. I told First Leaf I'd also like some reds in my introductory six-pack of wine, and they sent me some really great bottles to try, all for just $29.95 for my first shipment. These wines are valued at at least $20 per bottle, so that's a great deal. Then when your wines arrive, you taste them and rate them online. First Leaf takes your ratings and selects more wines personally selected for you to send in your next shipment. That's really cool. Right now, if you sign up with my link, you'll get an exclusive intro offer. Six bottles of wine for only $29.95 plus free shipping. Just go to tryfirstleaf.com slash once. That's six bottles of wine plus free shipping at tryfirstleaf.com slash once. I'd also like to thank Endurance Warranty for sponsoring today's show. Endurance is a direct provider of vehicle protection plans that saves drivers thousands of dollars on auto repairs and is one of the largest vehicle protection companies in the United States. Think about the last time you had a breakdown. I can remember mine well. What a nightmare. Not only the inconvenience of getting your car towed, finding a garage, negotiating repairs, but also the high price of car repair bills. Yuck. These kind of hassles are what you can avoid with an Endurance Vehicle Protection Plan. With Endurance, you can drive confidently. With Endurance and Endurance Elite Membership, when a breakdown happens, they'll handle the towing and pay the mechanic directly. Endurance's auto advocates will help you with everything from negotiating the best repair prices to finding you a hotel room if you're away from home. These are some of the reasons why Endurance is rated the number one vehicle protection company by Consumer Affairs. Combined with insurance, Endurance ensures you have total protection. For a limited time, Endurance Elite membership is included with every vehicle protection plan and includes 24-7 roadside assistance, a personal concierge, tire repair, and even ID theft recovery and replacement. Insurance plus endurance equals total protection. And right now, if you go to endurancenow.com slash once, you can get $300 off an endurance vehicle protection plan. That's endurancenow.com slash once. For more information about Endurance's vehicle protection plans, visit EnduranceWarranty.com. Robert Emmett Chambers Jr. was born September 25, 1966. He was the only child of Robert Sr., an accountant, and Phyllis Chambers, an Irish immigrant who worked as a private nurse for some of New York's wealthy families. She moved to New York in the 1950s and met her husband. They lived in Queens, and Phyllis started working double shifts after her son Robert was born. She was determined to give him the best of everything. She wanted him to have every opportunity possible to live the American dream that she herself strived for. Through hard work and determination, the Chambers were able to move to a small apartment located on New York City's Park Avenue in 1975. When Robert was 14, They moved into a brownstone apartment located at 11 East 90th Street. Robert had already been attending a private school since the age of four. Robert Sr. and Phyllis Chambers were strict Catholics. They enrolled their son in St. David's, a private Catholic school located on Manhattan's east side. Being a St. David's student would give Robert Jr. a better shot at being accepted to one of the city's prestigious private secondary schools. Robert, or Rob as he was called by family and friends, did well at St. David's. His grades were decent, if not stellar, but he made up for it with his athletic abilities. He was one of St. David's top athletes. 
He would grow to be six foot four inches tall and powerfully built. He would also be described by many as handsome, with dark hair, blue eyes, and a dimpled chin. Teachers and students liked Rob and would later describe him as polite and affable. The Chambers family attended St. Thomas More Roman Catholic Church on East 89th Street. Phyllis Chambers became active in the congregation, and Rob served as an altar boy. His mother made important connections with high-ranking clergy members, not only through church activities, but also because she worked as a private nurse to some of its more prominent members. When Rob Chambers received the Sacrament of Confirmation in the church, his sponsor was Theodore McCarrick, who would later become Archbishop of Newark and then Cardinal in 2001. But more on Cardinal McCarrick later. Rob Chambers had been somewhat quiet and shy during his elementary school years, but he came out of his shell beginning in his junior high years. At around the age of 14, he became more social, hanging out with other prep school kids at a teen disco in the Upper East Side. He may have also become less shy at that time because it was then that he began drinking alcohol. His parents were proud of their son when he was accepted at Choate, a prestigious private college prep school in Connecticut. He began his first semester at Choate in the fall of 1980. But at the same time, his family was falling apart. His mother and father had been having problems for some time. His father was a drinker who was rarely home. His mother worked nights and sometimes picked up extra shifts during the day. Rob was left home alone much of the time, which made it easy to wander around the city hanging out with friends. Beginning in junior high school, one of Rob's favorite places to pass the time was Central Park's Sheep Meadow. He discovered it was a good place to score drugs. He had started smoking pot at the age of 14, although alcohol was still his drug of choice. As Rob started drinking and partying more, he focused less on school, sometimes skipping classes altogether. He fell behind in school and his grades slipped. He'd grown into a good-looking boy who was popular with the girls. At this time, it also became apparent that Rob was more interested in dating younger girls. While in high school, he dated girls who were in junior high. When he became college-aged, most of his girlfriends still attended high school. Rob always had a girlfriend, but was secretive about them. He often didn't want them to come around where he was hanging out with his friends, and he ignored them when they were around. His girlfriends were often irritated with him, and he didn't seem to care much, until they broke up with him. Then he would become desperate to win them back. He failed many of his classes during his first year at Choate, and the school declined to ask him back for his sophomore year. Instead, he entered the all-boys school, Browning College Prep, in New York City. But his attendance and grades didn't improve. If anything, he attended school less now that he was back on his home turf. Friends said that he was high most of the time after returning to the city in the fall. He skipped school and smoked pot in the park during the day, and drank in the bars at night. Like Jennifer Levin, Rob had also found it easy to score a fake ID and began frequenting places like Studio 54 and other trendy nightclubs. Robert and some of his other classmates stayed out until all hours of the morning at these clubs. He didn't worry about coming home drunk or even at all, since his mother was away all night in patients' homes. After just one semester at Browning, Rob was expelled, but not simply for poor grades. He had been caught under the influence of drugs and also stealing from a teacher. Rob's family wasn't wealthy, so to try and keep up appearances and fit in, and also to have money for drugs, he began to steal. First, it was small amounts of cash, but would later turn into the theft of credit cards, jewelry, and other items, often from friends' homes. He was enrolled in York Prep for the second semester of his sophomore year. Even though his parents were doing everything they could to keep Rob in good schools, he never appreciated it and continued to shirk his studies. Once again, he flunked out of most of his classes and continued drugging and stealing. By 1983, he'd completely broken ties with his more studious and responsible friends and was associating exclusively with other partiers. His oldest and closest friend, John Tuenko, stopped hanging out with him. He later said that Rob had changed and he could no longer stand by and watch his, quote, self-destructive lifestyle, unquote. The summer after his sophomore year, his mother found him a job working as a messenger for a law firm, most likely trying to keep him out of trouble. 
By his junior year of high school, his classmates and friends were all wealthy, well-connected, and attending the best schools. Rob Chambers had squandered his opportunities, and his self-esteem began to crumble. The worse he felt about himself, the more he drank. He also became addicted to cocaine. Rob didn't like the social scene. He was jealous of his wealthy friends, but also wanted to be accepted by them. The same type of conundrum existed at home. He felt pressured by his mother to succeed and hated it, but also couldn't stand the thought of disappointing her. During his senior year, while his classmates were throwing private parties at ritzy new nightclubs and hotels, Rob began hanging out with a tougher crowd. He was straddling two worlds. One was his life with his preppy and privileged friends, and the other was hanging out with druggies and delinquents in Central Park. Somehow, Rob was able to graduate high school and was accepted at the College of Basic Studies at Boston University. The program was set up to accommodate students who had struggled in high school. But after only one semester, he was kicked out for academic reasons. Friends of his would later say that he did almost no schoolwork, but simply used this college opportunity as a way to party in Boston. He returned to New York in 1985. Because he preferred younger girls, he started dating high school girls. These girlfriends seemed impressed enough to be dating a college boy that they didn't look closely at his history of failure. Rob Chambers became a regular at Dorian's Bar, and he drank there most nights. He'd been in school with Michael Dorian, the owner Jack's son. Rob was close to the family, and Jack Dorian would later become one of his most faithful supporters after his arrest for murder. Rob Chambers and Jennifer Levin would soon be on a collision course toward one another, but long before that fateful night of August 26, 1986, Rob would already be deeply immersed in a life of crime. In his early teens, Rob Chambers already had an alcohol and drug habit and had begun committing crimes to pay for these activities. Initially, he pilfered jewelry and cash from friends' homes during parties. Later, he took fur coats and credit cards. He once stole a friend's parents' American Express card and went on a $3,000 shopping spree. He was caught with some of the stolen items and suspected of other thefts, but not wanting to cause embarrassment to his family, the victims allowed his mother to pay them back or otherwise make restitution for their losses. He continued to go to school and hang out with those whose homes he'd stolen from without experiencing any real consequences for his actions. Which may be why his crimes not only continued, but escalated. Chambers had been friends with a guy named David Filia since junior high school. After he returned to New York, Chambers started hanging out with Filia in Sheep Meadow, scoring drugs and just avoiding any real responsibilities. According to police, Filia was a member of a group who were committing burglaries on the Upper East Side. Together, Chambers and Filia committed three burglaries in the fall of 1985. Known as one of the prep school kids, Chambers' job was to enter the buildings, make his way to the roof terrace, and enter apartments that way. In total, the two young men took over $70,000 in money and property. Robert Chambers was identified as a suspect when his driver's license was found on a fire escape of one of the burglarized buildings. By this time, Chambers was already suspected by friends of being a thief. Money disappeared from purses and wallets at Dorian's when he was around. Some girls even set a trap to prove it was Chambers, leaving some items within easy access, which were later found in his possession. Still, he continued to attend parties and drink at the bar with these same people. They just kept a close eye on him and didn't leave anything unattended. Jennifer Levin had already seen the tall, handsome guy named Robert Chambers several times at Dorian's. She told friends she thought he was gorgeous and wanted to meet him. Her friend was throwing a combination birthday and Valentine's Day party in February of 1986, and Jennifer asked her to invite him. Her friend wasn't too keen on the idea, since Chambers was known to steal from homes during parties, but she finally agreed to invite him at Jennifer's insistence. Chambers had been dating a senior at Chapin, 
an Upper East Side all-girls school. They had been together off and on for two years, but she had broken up with him earlier that year and started dating someone else. According to friends, Chambers was crushed, but tried to act nonchalant when he saw her with her new boyfriend, who was popular with the prep school crowd. Jennifer and Chambers were introduced at the party, but he didn't show too much interest in the pretty freshman until later that summer. Before that happened, he would be sent out of town to attend rehab. There are two versions of the circumstances under which Robert Chambers was sent to the Hazelden Drug Rehab Facility in Minnesota in the spring of 1986. One story is that he left on spring break to visit a friend in Florida, and while he was gone, his mother found drug paraphernalia in his room. When he returned, he was shipped off to Hazelden. The other version is that it was a condition the prosecutor offered to Chambers in exchange for going leniently on him for the burglary charges. But whatever the reason, Chambers was gone for a month, and when he returned, he told friends he had kicked his cocaine habit. Still, he continued drinking and smoking pot almost every day. The summer of 1986 started as usual for the prep school kids. Those with money went off on European vacations or to their family vacation homes in the Hamptons. Those with less, like Jennifer Levin, found jobs. Jennifer was hired that summer as a restaurant hostess at the South Street Seaport. In the evenings, she would attend parties and meet up with friends at Dorian's. She and Chambers met up again at Dorian's in June. Her beau, Brock, had left for Europe for the summer, and they planned to get back together in the fall. But for now, Jennifer was interested in spending time with Robert Chambers, whom she'd had a crush on for some time. On their first date, they left Dorian's together and went to Chambers' house. She was there until the early morning, but told friends that they had not had sex, but merely spent time talking and getting to know each other. She was very attracted to him and was eager to see him again. The summer progressed, and many of Jennifer's friends were out of the city at their beach houses. She called one of them in July to say that she and Robert had seen each other a couple of times over the summer. Also, Jennifer said, they had finally slept together and she really liked him. Her friends said she was happy for her. Robert would later deny dating Jennifer and said they were just friends. Meanwhile, he had begun dating another girl, a 16-year-old named Alex Cap. As an interesting aside, Alex Cap is now an actress, best known for her role as one of the mean moms in the sitcom The New Adventures of Old Christine, starring Julia Louis-Dreyfus and Wanda Sykes. The show aired from 2006 to 2010. But in the summer of 1986, Alex Cap was just a pretty blonde junior in high school who was dating 19-year-old Robert Chambers. Chambers began telling friends that summer that he was trying to get his life together. He said he was planning to take classes at Columbia in the fall, but most didn't believe him. They still saw him sticking to his regular routine of drinking every night at Dorian's and smoking pot in the park. By the end of August, Chambers still hadn't enrolled in school or found a regular job. His girlfriend Alex even tried to help him, but was rewarded for her efforts by having money stolen from her by her boyfriend. He had taken to avoiding Alex and lying to her, and she was thinking about breaking up with him. Friends would later describe Robert Chambers as being unstable and at the end of his rope in the late summer of 1986. He was sick of the social scene, calling it phony, but still wanted to fit in with his peers. He had failed at every school and had been caught with drugs and charged with theft. He knew he was disappointing his mother, and even though he hated how she pressured him to live up to the ideals of success, position, and wealth, he knew that she just wanted the best for him. Hating to let her down over and over, he lied to his mother about his accomplishments as his life continued to unravel. On the other hand, he had been given everything and held accountable for almost nothing. He just wanted everyone to get off his back, let him live the way he wanted to, and not judge him. While he wanted the trappings of his more successful preppy friends, he was unwilling to do even the small amount required of him, such as focusing on his studies and staying out of trouble. Instead, he spent his time with the likes of David Filia and his gang of thieves and hoodlums. Just a few weeks after Chambers and David Filia began burglarizing apartments, Filia was arrested for an attack on a Columbia University student. 
He was charged with entering student Sarah Thomas's dorm room in the early morning hours of October 10, 1985, and attempting to rape her before stabbing her several times. She was rushed to the hospital in critical condition, but survived. He would be found guilty of attempted murder and other charges and sentenced to 10 to 20 years in prison. He would later be suspected of several other attacks on women in New York City. I could do a whole episode on Philia alone, but that's something for another day. As the summer wound down, Jennifer's boyfriend Brock returned from Europe. They both admitted their summer flings. She told him she'd had sex with Robert Chambers, but that he was just a crush. They both decided to recommit to each other in the fall, as they were both headed to school in Boston. Brock would be attending Northwestern University, and Jennifer had enrolled in Chamberlain Junior College. They were both excited and anticipated starting their relationship fresh in the fall. On August 25th, Jennifer was staying at the apartment of her friend, Alex Lagata. It was a week before everyone would be heading off to school again, and most of the gang was back in town. They were ready to party and see friends they'd been apart from all summer. Jennifer was particularly amped. Everything was going well for the pretty petite brunette. She was set to start college. She'd had a vacation in California and attended some parties in the Hamptons before returning to the city. There was still some tension between her and her parents, but she loved them and thought that when she went off to college and there was some distance between them, everything would smooth out some. She'd really enjoyed her time in Boston when she'd visited a friend at her college and was looking forward to moving there. But tonight was about having fun with her friends. She was also hoping to see Rob Chambers and have one last fun night with him before the summer ended and she moved to New England. Jennifer borrowed a white tank top and pink skirt to wear that night from her friend Alex. The two then met friends for dinner at a Mexican restaurant. Jennifer drank two margaritas and some champagne. After dinner, they went to Dorian's Red Hand, where everyone had gathered. Jennifer was already feeling some effects of the alcohol she drank earlier. No one described her as drunk, but merely happy and a little hyper. She was talking, laughing, and flirting, and generally having a good time with her friends. Robert Chambers was also at Dorian's that night. He'd been there since early in the evening, sitting at the bar, drinking alone. He was quiet and wasn't joining in with the other merrymaking. He seemed to be in a mood. He was supposed to meet his girlfriend Alex Cap at 8 p.m. for a date, but left the bar, not returning until about 11.30. Cap was there waiting for him, but he still didn't approach her to explain his tardiness, and in fact, didn't come over to talk to her at all. She waited with a group of friends, but he ignored them. Finally, around 1 a.m., Cap confronted Chambers. She was angry and told him she didn't want to see him again. She had a box of condoms with her and threw them at him, telling him to go use them with someone else because he wouldn't be using them with her. She then stormed out of the bar. Chambers tried to laugh it off, but everyone had witnessed this display and was laughing at him. He remained alone at the bar. Jennifer approached and took a seat next to him. Her friend, Alex Lagata, got ready to head back to her apartment with her boyfriend around 2 a.m. She told Jennifer she was leaving, and Jen asked her to place a key under the doormat so she could let herself in later. When Legata left, she observed Jennifer and Rob Chambers in deep conversation. About 4.30 a.m., Jennifer and Chambers left the bar together. They entered Central Park at 86th Street, arriving around 4.50 a.m. Why they went to the park remains a mystery. Chambers' apartment was close by, and his mother worked nights. He could have taken her there instead of the grassy area adjacent to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. According to Chambers, they'd just gone to the park to talk. He denied that he'd gone there to have sex with Jennifer. Chambers would report that as they walked, Jennifer spoke of her excitement about starting school in Boston. She invited him to visit her there, but he replied that he wasn't interested. According to him, he told Jennifer if he ever saw her again, it would be at Dorian's only. Upon hearing this, Chambers later told police, Jennifer became angry and flew at him in a rage, scratching his face. He walked away from her, but instead of leaving, he said he sat down on the grass a little way off from where he'd left her. He said that Jennifer came over to him and began to initiate sex. He would later describe the following version of events in detail on videotape during his police interview. 
Jennifer had taken off her underwear and, while standing behind him, tied them loosely around his hands that were behind his back. She then pushed him to the ground, onto his back, straddling him with her back to him and undid his shirt and pants. She began to masturbate him, and he told her to stop. She wouldn't let go, Chambers said, and started to grab him roughly, hurting him. He said he reacted by freeing his hand and, with his left arm, pulled her back by the neck, flipping her over him. She fell to the ground and stopped moving. He could see she was unconscious. Chambers said he tried to rouse her, but she didn't move. He estimated this had occurred around 5.30 a.m. Around 5 a.m., a jogger was running through the park. He saw the couple together under a tree in the grass and assumed they were having sex. When he passed by again on his way back, around 20 minutes later, he heard someone cry out in what sounded like pain. The man was a doctor and called out, Are you all right? to see if anyone needed assistance. Someone called back that everything was okay. He continued on. He later joked about this to another jogger, who also said he'd observed the couple together that morning. It was now the morning of August 26. At about 6 a.m., a cyclist named Pat Riley was riding through Central Park and noticed a body lying under a tree. As she approached, she saw it was a girl. Her blouse had been pushed up by her neck, and her skirt was also hiked up. Pat Riley rode to the nearest payphone and called 911. She returned to the girl's body and remained with her until the emergency vehicles arrived. They quickly determined that the girl was dead, and investigators were called to the scene. When detectives arrived, they thought the girl was attacked by a sexual predator. There was heavy bruising and scratches all over her body and severe bruising on her neck. They saw tan lines around her fingers and thought she must have also been robbed of her jewelry. The pockets of her denim jacket were searched for identification, but Jennifer only had her fake ID on her. Luckily, there was also a key card for Alex Legata's apartment building. They took a photo of the deceased girl and showed it to the building's doorman. He recognized her as the girl staying with Legata, and she was finally identified as Jennifer Levin. Her parents were contacted with the terrible news later that morning. Hearing about a young dead girl found in Central Park, reporters converged on the area to get the story. All the while, Robert Chambers sat just yards away from the crime scene. As police arrived, and then the media, he sat on a low stone wall across the driveway from where Jennifer's body lay. One officer remembered seeing him there as emergency vehicles arrived. Chambers eventually left the scene, walking a few blocks home. He took a shower and got a few hours of sleep. Robert Chambers was soon identified as the last person seen with Jennifer Levin. Alex Legata even called Chambers and asked where he'd last seen Jennifer. He told her they had not left Dorian's together, although several people had witnessed this. Chambers said she'd left alone, telling him she was going to Brock's apartment. Legata learned that Brock wasn't even in the city that weekend and knew that Chambers was lying. About 2 p.m., police arrived to question Robert Chambers. The first thing they noticed were long scratches on both sides of his face. When asked about them, he said a cat had scratched him. They took him into the police station to question him further. They would later find more scratches on his chest and a small injury to his right hand. He remained at the station and was questioned on videotape until about 10 p.m. when his attorney arrived. He finally made a statement admitting to killing Jennifer Levin, but said it but said it was an accident. He had simply been defending himself when she attacked him. He'd only been trying to get her off him when she was hurt. Investigators pointed out that it would be pretty easy to defend himself against a 5-foot, 4-inch, 100-pound girl. He stood at 6-foot, 4 and weighed 220 pounds. He could have lifted her off easily, they said. But if he had used too much force and injured the girl, 
why hadn't he run for help? He replied that he was in a state of shock and wasn't thinking clearly. An autopsy would determine that the extent of Jennifer's injuries could not be explained by a chokehold from behind. Bruises were found on her throat, and she had suffered internal injuries. Bite marks were also found on her body. The coroner concluded that Jennifer most likely had been subjected to manual strangulation for at least 20 seconds before she died. Two weeks after his arrest, a grand jury indicted Robert Chambers on two counts of second-degree murder, intent to kill, and depraved indifference to human life. Each count carried a maximum penalty of 25 years to life. Chambers was released on $150,000 bail on October 1st. Archbishop Theodore McCarrick wrote a letter of support for his bail application. Jack Dorian put up his townhouse as collateral for the bond. I told you I'd come back to Archbishop McCarrick. Here's the story. After McCarrick served as Archbishop of Newark, he was made a cardinal in the Catholic Church in 2001. He served as Archbishop in Washington, D.C. from 2001 to 2006 and was considered a power broker during that time, rubbing shoulders with prominent politicians and other important figures. In 2018, he was removed from active ministry due to sexual abuse allegations. He submitted his resignation from the College of Cardinals, and it was accepted by Pope Francis that year. He was tried and found guilty of sexual crimes against adults and minors, as well as abuse of power, and he was dismissed from the clergy in 2019. He is the most senior official in modern times to be defrocked, and is believed to be the first cardinal ever defrocked for sexual abuse. Back to Robert Chambers. After he was released on bail, he was required to meet daily with Monsignor Thomas Leonard and refrain from alcohol and drugs. While out on bail awaiting his trial, Chambers was videotaped at a party. In the video, he is seen surrounded by girls in lingerie and mugging for the camera with a Barbie doll. In the video, he appears to be mocking Jennifer Levin's death by twisting the head off of the doll and then saying, Oops! I think I killed her. There was a media uproar, but the tape did not become public until after his trial had ended. Chambers' trial lasted three months, with the media covering every detail of the preppy murder. The defendant was portrayed as a handsome prep school graduate with an elite pedigree, while Jennifer was accused of being a girl of loose morals who lived a risky lifestyle. Her name was dragged through the mud, and the prosecutor presented her past sexual history in detail for the jury. While shameful and disgusting to Jennifer's family and friends, the victim blaming by the defense was the only card they had to play. Her death was clearly shown not to be an accident, as Chambers continued to claim, but a prolonged and vicious attack. Prosecutors contended that Chambers had been drunk and high when he killed Levin. They theorized that he had attacked her in a drunken rage after he was unable to perform sexually. Her autopsy would show that Jennifer had only a very small amount of alcohol in her blood at the time of her death and had ingested no drugs. After nine days of deliberation, the jury was deadlocked. They were unable to come to a decision as to whether the prosecution had proved that the killing was premeditated. A plea bargain was then presented to Chambers. He was allowed to plead guilty to the lesser charge of manslaughter in the first degree, and one count of guilty for the burglary charges that were still pending against him. In exchange, he would serve between 5 and 15 years in prison. He took the plea deal. Chambers served most of his time at Auburn State Prison and was later moved to the Clinton Correctional Facility. He was not successful during his time in prison either. In total, He had 27 disciplinary violations on his prison record, including citations for weapons and drugs and an assault on a correctional officer. He spent about four years of his time in solitary confinement. Because of his prison record, he had to serve the maximum time, 15 years, before being released. He walked out of prison on February 14, 2003. 
but his troubles with the law continued. A year after his release, he was arrested for heroin possession and driving with a suspended license. He pled guilty and was sentenced to 100 days in jail. One of the girls in the lingerie video was named Sean Covell. She had begun dating Chambers a month after his arrest and waited for him until he was released from prison. They moved to Georgia, where a friend of Covell's lived, and Chambers got a job at a dye factory. They were doing well there, but when Covell's mother died of cancer, they returned to New York to take over her rent-stabilized apartment in Midtown Manhattan. Back in Manhattan, Robert fell into old habits, and on October 22, 2007, he was arrested in his 17th-floor apartment. Neighbors in the building had complained of drug dealing taking place out of Chambers and Covell's apartment. A drug sting took place, and Chambers was caught selling undercover officers $2,800 worth of heroin before he was arrested. He was also charged with resisting arrest and assault on an officer. Photos of his arrest show the 41-year-old looking dirty and disheveled. Sean Cavell, age 39, was also arrested. She would serve 18 months in a drug rehab facility and then placed on probation. Robert Chambers was charged with three counts of selling a controlled substance in the first degree, three counts of selling a controlled substance in the second degree, and one count of resisting arrest. He was found guilty and sentenced to 19 years in prison. His earliest release date is 2024. Jennifer Levin's family filed a civil suit against Robert Chambers for the death of their daughter and were awarded $25 million. Chambers is required to hand over 10% of any money he earns to the Levins for the rest of his life. They also sued Jack Dorian, who they faulted in part for Jennifer's death, for continuing to serve Robert Chambers alcohol after he was already clearly intoxicated. Ellen Levin found it outrageous that Chambers was given more time in prison for drug dealing than for the murder of her daughter. She has since become an advocate for victims' rights and worked to have a rape shield law enacted in New York State. The law limits the ability to introduce evidence or cross-examine rape complainants about a victim's past sexual history. She also fought for the right of victims to speak in court and at the parole hearings of their attackers. Ellen Levin now has three grandchildren who she says give her so much joy. But she also says, quote, there's always going to be a missing piece, and that's Jennifer, unquote. The last question many still have is exactly what happened that night when Jennifer lost her life. I'm a believer in the adage, in every lie, there's always a little truth. I believe Robert Chambers' account when he said that they were talking in the park. Jennifer, he said, was excited about starting college in Boston in the fall. We also know from Jennifer's friends that she was hoping to have one last fling with her crush that night before moving on to the next phase of her life. I believe that Chambers saw a beautiful girl with her whole life ahead of her and was jealous. He must have known that, like him, she did not come from a wealthy family, but unlike him, she'd been successful at navigating the prep school scene. She had lots of friends who genuinely liked her. She had graduated from a good school and was now heading off to college and was excited about her future. Chambers had been telling himself for years that the reason he had not succeeded was because his wealthy friends had all the advantages and he was an outsider. He made excuses for himself instead of admitting that he had wasted all the opportunities his mother had worked so hard to provide him. Jennifer was an example of all that could have been. She had made the most of her opportunities and had been rewarded for it. All he could see was a life of failure and mediocrity. In that moment, I can imagine him becoming enraged and losing control. He was in control of nothing in his own life, but he had complete power and control over this girl, and he used her to vent his anger and frustration about his own wasted life. It just happened to be Jennifer Levin who would pay with her life for something that was in no way her fault. 
It was a tragedy that she trusted Robert Chambers and never suspected that her life was in danger on that early morning in August 1986. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Our administrative research and production assistant is Lorena Garcia. Our copy editor is Crystal Dernan. And original music is by Aaron Michael Goldberg. Thanks for listening and telling a friend. Until next time, be good to one another. <laughs>